Well, good evening and welcome to the ASI's latest webinar. Uh, this evening, we are looking at the very important topic of reforming the state um, after COVID. Uh, and when we when we planned this uh, quite a number of weeks ago, we didn't quite realise extent which this would uh, really begin to dominate the discussion in recent days. Um, I'm very excited to be joined by Douglas Carswell, as, doc, as well as Dr. Chris O'Leary. Um, uh, David Davis would hopefully be joining us a little bit later on. Unfortunately, he's stuck in Parliament voting at the moment, doing his uh, patriotic duty for us um, as an MP. Uh, I'm just going to start off with a few opening remarks, and then we'll get to, to Douglas and Chris. Um, the British democracy is supposed to operate with the abilities of a, a brand new Rolls Royce, but if anything, the COVID-19 crisis has shown it's a bit of a rusty old Soviet Trabant. Um, at almost every turn from Public Health England's failure to ramp up tests to White House struggles with personal protective equipment, the bureaucracy has failed the biggest challenge of our lifetime. The UK is now facing the highest COVID-19 death toll in Europe, uh, if not one of the highest in the world when consuming excess deaths. And um, this is in contrast to other countries, not like every country has done um, the same as the UK. You can see in Europe, the, a country like Germany has done uh, better or a country like Austria um, you see countries like Australia or Israel or potentially the world leaders and the Asian Tigers, the Singapore's, the South Korea's, the Taiwan's. Um, to me, I think the state failure in this uh, crisis has probably followed kind of almost a pattern in a way. Um, I'm calling it a, a four-stage pattern. Um, stage one is smugness. Uh, public Health England claims it can do all the testing we need, that there's enough PPE, that we've freed up space in the hospitals, that a British-made app will be better than anything else. In stage two, we have command and control. Uh, PHE thinks it can do everything itself. It rebuffs offices from, offers from universities, from charities, from companies. Uh, Whitehall takes over the entire procurement process for the entirety of the NHS, but then ignores offers from domestic providers and particularly small offers. Uh, we have the clinical commission groups who order care homes to take patients uh, despite their concerns and certainly without being tested. And then the NHS rejects the Apple Google framework so that they can centralize the data. Step four, we have the inevitable failure. Uh, there's not enough tests to prevent an outbreak. Medics complain about a lack of PPE. Thousands of people die in care homes and contact tracing isn't available five months after a virus emerged. Then we have the blame game. Inevitably, it's always someone else's fault. It's the foreign supply chain. It's the lack of domestic diagnostic industry. It's the health departments, public health England. This is despite the fact that there are identifiable and warned about strategic mistakes from, from earlier on in the process. Um, this is an issue, I think, beyond partisanship at this point. This is really fundamentally about what the state does and has it got its capacity to fulfill its role. Um, I was astonished to read um, Paul Collier, who's a professor of economics and public policy at the University of Oxford, write in the New Statesman, barely a, a right-wing rag, and, and I quote him, Britain is heavily overinvested in its belief in the efficacy of centralized state direction. Underpinning this belief are two fallacies. One is that the top knows best about what it can do. It knows best because it is staffed by those of the highest caliber and they join the finest expertise. The other is that central bureaucracy is necessary for coordination. There was one person submitted in the comments to this, we face incredible levels of ignorance, arrogance, incompetence, corruption, and inefficiency. Um, as I was saying, this is a, a very well-timed webinar, even if not intentionally. Um, we just heard Boris Johnson give a major address today, which included the remarks about the need to fix the parts of government that seem to respond so sluggishly so that, so that sometimes it seemed like reoccurring bad dream when you are telling your feet to run. Or Michael Gove, who gave a major lecture on public service on the weekend and discussed how failures of policy and judgment have put previously existing elites in the dock, he said. He wanted to say, their misjudgment in the eyes of many had been compounded by cultural condensation and insulation from accountability. Uh, he proposed things like devolution, to empower local communities and, and spur innovation. He talks about relocating bureaucrats out of Whitehall. We can talk a bit more about these later. He talks about recruiting uh, more mathematicians and fewer social scientists in the civil service. Uh, the end of the departmental merry-go-round to encourage specialization and, and strengthening evaluation and evidence building and encourage more risk and novelty. One thing he didn't discuss, uh, as I wrote about in Telegraph this week, was the fact that we also need to reconsider um, the role of the state and what it should be doing and potentially focusing it more um, on the things that matter and less so on additional issues that can distract it from its core goals and its core focus. Um, but I'm very excited to first be joined in discussion by Douglas Murray, who is the co-director of the Good 
Governance Project, a former member of Parliament and a, a co-founder of Vote Leave, the official Brexit campaign. Uh, he's written too many books to list and too many papers that I'm sure he's, he's forgetting, forgotten more papers than I've ever written myself. Um, we're going to go to you first, Douglas, to, to introduce what your view is on, on governance and reform. Hello, Matthew, and hello, participants. Um, I should just point out, I'm not actually Douglas Murray. I'm, I'm Douglas, Douglas Carswell. Carswell. Um, Sorry. <laughs> now, I'm just going to adjust this so that I um, have a gallery view. Um, is that OK? Can you see me OK? Brilliant. Um, I mean, I, I think there's a real tendency, Matthew, with this COVID crisis for people to look at it and particularly people like me to see in it the ultimate confirmation bias that we we look at what's happened and we see it as confirmation of the thing that we were banging on about before um and i think we hear a lot of that and we've got to be a little bit guarded about people who come along and say that this proves that the thing that they wanted to see changed has to now definitely be changed i think what we need to do instead is ask ourselves what what is it that the COVID crisis taught us about ourselves as a country? And I, I think it's undoubtedly the case that it's shown that the British state is suboptimal. Um, I think we could even go as far as to say that it's dysfunctional. And the reason for that is because what, what the COVID crisis does is it gives us an empirical way of measuring the effectiveness of our public policymakers and comparing them to other countries, similar sized countries at a similar stage of their development, who like us had this thing sprung on them and like us sometimes cope better, sometimes cope worse. And I think if we, if we do that, if we subject ourselves to that hard headed process of international comparison, it's pretty clear that we're suboptimal. Now you can't blame the government for things that they couldn't possibly foresee, but I think you can look at how others have done and I think this raises some pretty disturbing questions. For example, testing. You, you, Matthew, have written brilliantly on, on the whole issue of testing. Um, we have a system of command and control, but it's pretty clear that although we've got the machinery of command and control, the levers are detached and the buttons are disconnected. Nothing really happened. And compared to what happened in Germany with its decentralized system of competitive provision. On apps, again, I think I'm right in saying the Adam Smith Institute has done some great work on this. Um, it was predictable and predicted what's happened with apps. The severity of the lockdown. We allowed the commentariat class, the Beth Rigby's, the Pestons of this world, to make public policymakers obsess about whether or not we were sitting on park benches. But duh, no one thought about the care homes. That's not really a great way of tackling a public health problem. We heard a lot about the science during this, but it's pretty clear to me that actually the process of anal an analysizing scientific evidence is not empirical. It's actually bogus empiricism, what, what you might call inductivism. The police, I think, had a pretty appalling uh, lockdown. They focused on the petty, and yet they behaved, I think, rather foolishly when some of the public disorder consequences of the lockdown have become apparent. And the Quango State, Public Health England, I think, has just discredited and disgraced itself, but disgraced the whole idea that we should hand over to a group of quangocrats the responsibility to oversee public policy provision. So what, what, what's the effect of all of this? Well, I think it's done something far beyond any public health question. It, it's number one, it's mainstreamed the idea that there is something profoundly wrong with the administrative state. Up until six months ago, it was only a few people in Vote Leave, the sort of Dom Cummings blog readers, who would argue that the British state was dysfunctional. In fact, I remember as a backbench MP saying that the British state was dysfunctional and being dismissed by people who said I was just frustrated that the government wasn't doing what people like me wanted. But actually, if you stop and look back under Blair, the British state didn't do what he was elected to do and he found it frustrating. The same true under Brown, the same true under Cameron, the same true under Mrs May. Actually, Mrs May, I'm not sure she ever knew what she wanted to do, so that doesn't really count. But it's a long-term problem that actually requires a bipartisan approach. Um, and I think we need to now recognize that competence counts. If you have a state sector where people are promoted and managed and their career trajectory is not entirely contingent upon their competence, those state sector institutions become incompetent. If you promote people on the basis of anything other than effectiveness, state institutions become marinated in ineffectiveness. And I think this is now 
evident within the Quango state, evident within the civil service. And I don't mean to be too disparaging to our elected politicians, but I think it's pretty clear that there's a problem too with cabinet and, and some of the elected branch of government too. So one thing I, I've been working on since last August is something called the Good Governance Project. And this is looking to see with, with Rado Tylercut to see if we can do things to improve in a, in a bipartisan way the efficacy of the British state and the, 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 the way in which public policy decisions are made. And I think Ditchley for me marks a, a significant milestone. Long before the, I'm not a big fan of the welfare state, but if, if you're going to put it like this, long before the welfare state was created in 1942, the beverage report identified that change was necessary. In the late 70s, the IMF produced a report highlighting the failures of Keynes in demand management. I think Ditchley is similarly uh, going to go down as a moment when it was clear that change was needed and that the case for change had been accepted. The details of the change, I don't think have been worked out. But I think we need to ask questions like, do the civil servants we have have the skills to do the job that we ask of them? Do we reward and pay them and align their interests to those of the public the way we should? Is there an optimal system of accountability? Does the, the, the theoretical system of accountability that we have work? Public procurement, a complete mess. We need to seriously rethink the whole process of, of public procurement. The appointments process. The appointments process within the British state is often run for the convenience of people within the system already. I think that needs to be changed. We talk a lot about diversity. There's very, very little diversity when it comes to outlooks and skill sets within the British state. This urgently needs to change. And the, the whole structure of the centre of government. Is it right? Can we really expect to have strategic coherence at the centre of government, whichever lot we elect, if you have a tiny Downing Street in a rabbit warren corridor system, detached from a cabinet office and detached from a treasury? Do we not now need to create an office of the prime minister that brings cohesion between those three units? There are also profound questions, I think, about the wider economy. Um, and I think it could go either way now. We, we, we could end up with a sort of a Hoover Dam approach, a New Deal approach, a Roosevelt approach for everything. And heaven help us if we do. If we accept the narrative that the New Deal was a triumph and a great success story, um, you know, heaven help us. Uh, we are today spending more in relative terms and running a higher deficit now than Roosevelt ever ran in the 1930s during the New Deal. Or we could go the other way. We could recognize that actually needs must. And when push comes to shove, we can do without a heck of a lot of these rules and regulations on everything from the rules that govern whether or not you can eat a pizza on a pavement in Fulham to the rules that determine how long it takes to come up with a clinical trial for a drug that you need to save patients' lives. If we can scrap a lot of these rules and regulations in an emergency scenario, think of what we could do in what you might call peacetime. So I think things could go either way on the economy. But what I find really encouraging is that Ditchley to me marks the moment when those at the apex of the system recognize that we can't carry on like this. We do not have a Rolls Royce civil service. And there's no fault incidentally of individual civil servants. There are lots of good people in the civil service, but goodwill unfortunately was not enough to provide people with the equipment they needed to deal with the COVID crisis. Goodwill is not enough to create an app. Goodwill alone is not a good way of ensuring that we have a functional system of government. So I think we now need to look at fundamental reform of the British state. And I think that can be done. And I think we've got a, a historic opportunity to build a consensus here. And I, I hope it's done in a way that appeals as much to disaffected and disillusioned Blairites as radical vote leavers. Well, thank you for that introduction. That's that's very it's a very good start. Um, I just want to start with a question about how we we go about practically achieving this. So, two ideas uh, that Gove spoke about in in his remarks. One was this idea of moving government departments outside of London. I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Whether or not you think that actually does achieve very much, or if it just ends up shuffling the deck chairs on the Titanic because you really don't change the centres of power, they're still in London. And then secondly is that, what, what does meaningful um, devolution or decentralisation of power look like in the UK where you, you 
really don't have the history of that. You don't necessarily have the extent of local buy-in. You have the state levels or in the US or Australia. You don't have the provinces in Canada. Um, how do we go about creating that culture of decentralization and that kind of, local, I guess, local identities um, around governance to some extent that is necessary uh, to make that work, as well as, I guess, the accountability mechanisms there? I'm, I'm always slightly skeptical when people talk about the need for just you know, lifting government departments and plonking them down in other parts of the country. I mean, it, it sounds good, doesn't it? Um, but actually, look at what's happened to, for example, the BBC when they moved to Salford. It creates actually, a second, uh, second London, really. Th there's a reason why we have these things called cities. And there's a reason why people come to cities and why a lot of economic activity happens in big cities. And I, I don't think it's desirable or practical to relocate for the sake of creating so-called balance. If in a normal functioning economy, you have imbalance, um, that's how you get specialization and exchange. If you had a perfectly balanced economy, you would have a sort of medieval manorial system where you would have a series of self-contained units. It's precisely the imbalance you have in the economy that leads to specialization and exchange. Heaven forbid that we should try to redistribute tourism from the beautiful beaches of Cornwall to um, you know, um, suburban West London. Um, you, 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 I think you need to recognize that there are perhaps parts of government that could be relocated. But realistically, if you want to create and attract talented, capable people, you have to acknowledge there's a reason why talented, capable people congregate in certain areas. Um, so I'm, I'm slightly skeptical about that. On the whole question, however, of decentralization, I'm, I'm a huge localist. And I, I think one of the reasons why the United States is the supreme republic, the most successful republic has been since, since the Roman, um, is because the, the founding fathers who created the United States created this decentralized model. It is a union of states. It mm. is an amalgamation of disparate units. It is a coral reef economy. And that's why it does so incredibly well, precisely because despite the Wilsonian experiment, despite the dreadful centralization tendencies of FDR and Lyndon Johnson, the United States is still decentralized. We in this country, I think, could learn from other countries, perhaps not the American model, perhaps the Swiss model, but I'm a great believer in localism. The trick to localism though, is to decentralize control over revenue, over spending, over taxation. All attempt that have been made by Cameron, by Blair, by, by governments over the past 30 years to decentralize have always floundered because the treasury hasn't let go. You've got to allow loony lefty councils to tax and spend themselves into debt if that's what they want. And you've got to allow other councils to make all sorts of errors and mistakes. You've got to decentralize control over the finances. And I think if you're, if you're serious about decentralization, You've got to create a system. I, I would personally, now that we live in the European Union and we don't have to have VAT anymore, I would personally favor turning VAT. In fact, I wrote a paper for the Adam Smith Institute on this 15 years ago. I would turn VAT into our local sales tax so that different counties could set a different rate. And um, I think if, you, if you're serious about decentralization, you've got to work out how you devolve control over the money. Everything else is blah, blah. Would you support something like a Canadian style um, income tax part? Um, I think the, this elements this in the States as well, where there's a t income tax component um, you pay to your council or your region or whatever else that might be. I, I wouldn't really doubt. I mean, one of the people often say Sweden has a relatively or had in the, uh, 20 years ago, a relatively high rate of income tax, but a lot of that was collected at a municipal level. I, I don't object per se to creating a system of taxation so long as taxation brings with it responsibility and, and accountability, so long as the mm. voters can kick the buggers out, that's what counts. It doesn't really matter what, what, how you do it, whether it's a local sales tax or a local income tax, so long as at the end of the day, you can hold to account the people who are wasting your money and throw them out of office, then, then I don't think it really matters. But you know, at the moment, we have... Um, a system of government where every five years we have an election and it's a, you have to go back quite a number of elections before there was any serious attempt to offer the voters a lower tax and spend alternative. 
In fact, I can remember a number of conservatives who, who, who sought office, George Osborne and all the rest of them, who sought office by explicitly saying you couldn't have tax cuts. I, I, I think in order to get tax cuts, you've got to make it in the interests of conservative politicians seeking election to offer tax cuts. And, and the way to do that is through accountability in, over finances. If, if you are standing for council in Salford or in Wales or in London or in Scotland or wherever, and it's ultimately the treasury that decides how much revenue the town hall gets. You're never going to be as thrifty as you are if it's money raised through local voters um, uh, with local voters permission. I think that's right. And, and there's, there's evidence that people can always uh, inevitably, to some extent, vote with their feet if they're not happy with their tax rate. And there's even, um, in terms of on fiscal decentralisation, we know pretty broadly from literature that it doesn't really work, devolution doesn't really work unless it's done in a fiscal sense. The, be the better outcomes are always linked to, to finances because you've got to have that chain of accountability. This is, I always thought local government finance was the three words designed to turn off any audience. And yet I noticed that since we've been talking about local government finance, actually the number of participants has gone up. So I'm shocked. I just want to move on to one other issue before we bring in Chris, which is this, this question about um, the extent to which we do have a true radicalism here or potentially a radicalism in the wrong direction. So, so Michael Grove, despite saying that he's wants more radical ideas, didn't really engage in his speech on Saturday night about fundamental questions about what the role of the state is and what it should be doing. Uh, we saw Boris Johnson speak today about how um, he wants an FDR-inspired New Deal to the extent to which he has to say, no, I'm not a communist, I promise. Um, I have a, a broader kind of concern that these issues that uh, Michael Gove was identifying about loss of public trust and faith in institutions and government is actually very much related to its expanding role. That's because as we've expanded the role of state, we've expected the state to everything. And then we've discovered that they're really not that good to do everything. They can't, literally can't do everything. But now we just, the, the question is not what we can do in the maybe de Tocqueville civil society sense or in the, the Burkean sense, but rather what we can ask the state to do. Um, if we're going to get government to be better, do we need the government to also be doing less? I think if you're going to look at American presidents for inspiration, instead of looking at um, FDR or heaven help us, um, Theodore Roosevelt, even worse. I think actually there's a president who really does stand out and should be the template for this government. And that is a much overlooked president, Calvin Coolidge. Calvin Coolidge came to office after the government had run up this massive debt, after there had been a, a, a flu epidemic, the Spanish flu rather than COVID. And he did something extraordinary. He cut taxes and he balanced the books. He shrunk the size of the state quietly and diligently. And as a consequence of that, he spread prosperity to Americans who were, uh, uh, because of the hardships of the war, um, were, were, were really suffering. And he spread prosperity and wealth through middle America. And I, I, I'm always slightly alarmed when I hear people talking about a new deal or um, people who, who take FDR as a role model. I think Roosevelt actually failed to solve America's problems. He, he turned a, a, a downturn into a slump and a recession. He did exactly the wrong things. He prolonged misery for millions of Americans. Uh, credit where it's due, he, he, he was part of the uh, uh, alliance in defeating uh, Nazi Germany, but it was only when America went to war that the economy started to recover. Actually, his measures before then were not only unsuccessful in their own measures, I think FDR and the administrative state that he created are the problem. They are the uh, experts. They are the uh, government offices with these um, abbreviated initials as their names that he spawned and which we subsequently spawned in emulation of America. They are the problem. It is the state that FDR bequeathed America and by extension, the Western world that has got us into this mess of being governed by experts. What we need to do, I think, is look back to the pre-Roosevelt model of government. Um, Calvin Coolidge, a great hero of mine, was effective precisely because he was humble. He knew that even when he was in the White House, he couldn't fix every problem. And I think government should focus on what it's there to do, balance the books, cut tax, allow entrepreneurship and new technology and prosperity to spread. If you try to fix every problem, if you try to create, heaven help us, a great society, you end up failing on all fronts. And that alarms me. And it was interesting to see Michael Gove uh, doing a whole speech about elites and, and worrying about centralization, but also referencing FDR, who was uh, potentially very elite and certainly very centralizing um, in terms of his distribution uh, 
disposition, sorry. I'm just going to bring in um, Dr. Chris O'Leary, uh, who is uh, the Deputy Director of the Policy Evaluation and Research Unit, the PEIU at the Manchester Metropolitan University, where he's also a senior lecturer. Um, the PIU evaluates policy design and delivery and researches public sector reform. Um, Chris, I was hoping you could give us a bit of introduction uh, and more, I guess, suppose a bit more of a technical academic sense about where you think public policy has failed during this crisis, um, what potential there is, and, and also just potentially the capacity for um, uh, better evaluation that Michael Grove has talked about as well, um, but also just better policy design. Yeah, thank you. Hello, Matthew. Um, great to be here and hello to everybody watching and listening. Um, I apologise for my crazy lockdown hair. Um, obviously, Douglas has got uh, access to somebody to cut his hair and I don't. Um, so by way of introduction, I just wanted to start by saying what I mean by policy failure, how it relates to the kind of governance failure that Douglas has been talking about, um, why it happens, and then two particular recommendations that I think we ought to be pushing in a post-COVID public administration world. Um, it is important to note that even in normal and ordinary times, policies fail. Um, they fail completely and spectacularly. Most of them fail by degrees, but they fail. Um, and they fail because of governance. They fail because of the policy making process. They fail because policy doesn't meet its objectives and they fail because of political assessment. And what we've seen in the pandemic is all of those happening and all of those happening in very short measure and quite significantly. But perhaps controversially, I'm going to say that um, policy failure is an inevitable part of public governance. There is absolutely no way we can ever have perfect uh, policy. We just can't get away from it. Um, we can, however, make things better. We can certainly um, broaden the number of people and the types of people that are involved in policy making. We can have much better evidence, but we can never get rid of policy failure. And I want to highlight three reasons why that is. So first of all, drawing on the work of, of William Niskanen um, back in the 1970s, Government is essentially a bilateral monopoly. It's a monopoly of uh, ministers um, who are making decisions, and it's a monopoly of civil servants giving advice to ministers. And as we know, monopolies are bad for consumers, which in this case is citizens, taxpayers, and service users, and it's also socially wasteful. Now, this is the case for all governments, of course, but in the UK context, because of our highly centralized bureaucratic and London centric system, the UK has an effect of amplifying the social wastefulness of government. And so one of the reasons we should always look at limited government is to limit that social wastefulness. Secondly, policymakers all face limited knowledge um, because of what Herbert Simon has called bounded rationality uh, because of fundamental uncertainty, when policymakers are making decisions, they're making decisions now about future policy, but based on the information they have now, and that information is likely to change and new information comes along over time. But also because of the nature of evidence, um, there is no such thing as a single perfect evidence. There is always contradictions in the evidence. Um, the evidence rarely points in a single direction to a single policy option. Evidence is context and time specific. And as we've seen in the scientific evidence during the pandemic, the evidence can be interpreted in a number of different ways, depending on your own political view and the way you want to interpret it. And finally, uh, policy fails because even taking all of that into account, a policy that works at one point in time may eventually not work um, after a long time. So what do we want to do? Well, firstly, I'm very cognizant of the fact that existing comparative public administration research says that the UK is, uh, is relatively high in terms of administrative reform. We basically, we like to change where the deck chairs are on the deck much more than other countries. And I'm also aware, as Douglas says, that there is a potential for confirmation bias. 
I'm a libertarian, I see government failure, I therefore say, look, I was right, we should be um, stripping about the state. Um, but I don't think it's just about comparing how the UK has done in this crisis to other countries, um, as Douglas suggests we do. Um, there is also an existing body of academic research which says that centralized bureaucratized systems perform less well the more federal, more localized, more devolved systems. Um, already an existing bunch of evidence that says, comparatively, the UK is worse off because of its system. So um, I do think we need to fundamentally change the way that power is structured in our governance system. There is some really good work being done at the moment by Simon Kay at the New Local Government Network, um, which is looking at the work of Eleanor Ostrom around localism and community empowerment. And I think that, that is gonna provide a, a blueprint for um, radically altering and devolving power to communities and to local government. And I think it's worth checking out. And I think Douglas and Matthew, you're both right that, that needs, the money needs to follow that as well as the, um, um, the evolution. Secondly, um, as a policy analyst and policy evaluator, I, of course, did welcome Michael Gove's speech when he said that better evaluation was needed. Um, however, we don't just need better evaluation. Um, what we need is evaluation to not be an afterthought in the policy process. Too often as an evaluator, um, government departments will come along and say, oh, we've set up this policy, we've implemented it. Could you just tell us whether it works? Um, and evaluators need to be involved in a much earlier part of the process. But in addition to knowing whether um, a policy works, we also need to know how it works and why it works and for whom it works. And more importantly, we need to learn from that. Politicians, unfortunately, um, Douglas, are very bad at actually listening to what evaluation evidence says. And there are a number of examples over the last 20 years where very good, robust evaluation has said that a policy has not worked, and yet the government of the day has not listened to that, extended and pumped more money into that failing policy. So um, we need politicians to take responsibility and to say, look, this policy is failing, we need to do something about it. And finally, as an academic, um, I think academics need to be better at translating the evidence and helping policymakers to navigate the evidence. And I think there also needs to be, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish on a very controversial statement. I think we also need more diversity in academia. And I don't just mean more black, minority, ethnic and women professors. I also mean more diversity of views. So I hope that um, gave people something to think about. Well, thank you very much. And and the idea that uh, you need more diversity in, in academia is certainly something that I don't think would be too controversial at the Adam Smith Institute. Um, considering our paper from none other than Noah Carl, uh, who unfortunately lost his position at the University of Cambridge um, uh, a few years ago, he wrote a paper for us discussing just how the diversity of views within academia have decreased and there's just very few conservatives left. Um, uh, uh, you, the more you talk about Herbert Simon, the more I have uh, flashbacks of my uh, masters in in public policy. And I think every single essay I wrote for exams and exam prep would uh, me mention bounded rationality um, as a as a fun little aside. I think you could also just say that as in some ways an extension of um, Hayek and the knowledge problem. Although Hayek applies the knowledge problem to um, business and prices and says the price system is successful. I think government fundamentally struggles in the same way in terms of policy making because it doesn't have the necessary knowledge. But if you, the, and the reason why decentralization actually is fundamentally more successful is the more locally um, made the policy is as much as is possible, it can actually depend more so on localized knowledge and local information. And that's why you have pretty robust evidence that, that um, policies and delivered more locally are, are going or designed more locally and delivered more locally are going to be better. Um, I just want to pick up a little bit on what Gove was saying in terms of um, evaluation. So he talked about government needs to be rigorous and fearless in its evaluation of policy projects. Um, ask questions like what value do they add? What incentives do they provide for better performance, better service to others? 
And then he went on to say the Treasury in the UK has been historically very good at questioning the cost of projects, but not their broader social value. Um, I suppose part of the inherent issue with evaluation is a sense in which it is genuinely quite, in, in the private sector, we have prices and we have profit and that's a perfect motivator. But in, in public policy, we don't really tend to know the value um, how much value I can get out of a certain program is is often very hard to calculate or very arbitrary. How how do you go about dealing with those challenges in policy evaluation and actually finding metrics that are that can truly determine the value of a of a policy? So um, I like I like to think of evaluation as basically answering four questions: Could it work? Should it work? Did it work? Was it worth it? Could it work? Is the policy sound theoretically? Have policymakers set out very clearly why doing X should lead to Y? Um, should it work? Has it actually worked on the ground? Has it been implemented well? What do service users and uh, staff involved and partners think about it? Uh, think about it. Um, how do the other parts of the public system that are around it work with it? Does it work? Um, does it work? Can we demonstrate that outcomes have been achieved? And are those outcomes attributable to that policy or that intervention? Now, that's the kind of um, policy evaluation that Michael Gove was focusing on when he was talking about randomized control trials. Um, RCTs are great and they tell us a great deal, but without knowing the other bits, um, all they say is doing, doing this kind of thing achieves this kind of outcome, but you don't know why and how it does. And more importantly, you don't know then how to translate that policy intervention from Hackney, for example, up into Cheshire, because they are very two different um, areas. And then finally, was it worth it? Um, and uh, Michael goes right, the Treasury for a very long time has focused on that the is it worth it do the costs are the costs outweighed by the benefits and there are various approaches to doing this um i'm hopefully going to be working very soon on on developing a tool for local authorities to work out the social value of their commissioning function local government spends about a fifth of public spending and a lot of it is spent on procurement and commissioning and most of it isn't spent very well um, as is most of the stuff that's commissioned by central government is not spent very well. Um, procurers tend to be very risk averse and they think risk averse means let's give it all to an organization that we know have done something before rather than spreading the risk by procuring lots of different organizations to be involved. And not only does that spread the risk, but competition also breeds innovation. It breeds different ways of doing things. It breeds different ways of engaging with service users through co-production or, or, or different, um, uh, you know, different areas. So I do think when we're talking about localization and when we're talking about localism, for me, it's not just about Whitehall saying, here, local government, here's a whole bunch of functions that you need to be doing now. It's about fundamentally transferring power and starting from the basis of what should individuals, communities and families do and what should, this, what should they be empowered to do? If they can't do it, what should local government do? And then if local government can't do it, what should national government do? So we've had a question from Martin Killip. Uh, if you can potentially go into some examples of policies that evaluators have said have failed um, and then their advice was ignored by governments and they went ahead. Yeah, i would give you two examples. Local housing allowance, which is the way that housing benefit rates are calculated for um, people who live in the private rented sector introduced in 2008 by the Labour government and then several reforms done to it um, uh, by George Osborne. Um, there was a pilot programme that was evaluated um, in the noughties and then there were several evaluations of the changes made by the Conservative government. If you look at the um, those evaluations, nobody in their right mind would have taken those evaluations and then carried on with local housing allowance. Um, and more importantly, there is a very strong correlation between housing benefit claimant rates 
and homelessness from the private rented sector. Um, that uh, the local housing allowance was a centralization of what had previously been local authority um, powers to determine what rates they pay. Um, second example I would give is troubled families. The national evaluation of troubled families used two different incredibly robust ways of looking at the impact or effect of troubled families. That evaluation said there was no evidence of it having any impact. The response of the Cameron government was to say, oh, okay, let's extend it and spend more money on it. <laughs> Classic in housing. Um, we might just bring Douglas back in here. We've got a question from uh, Lee Reynolds, who's asked, what is the role of political, quote, distraction, a uh, contributor in public policy failure? Too much time and focus on communication and not enough on actual governing I .e. less tweeting and more oversight. So, and I suppose that also speaks to some broader concerns being raised about this government. They're very focus group obsessed. That they're not necessarily focused on what wouldn't be good policy, but in in keeping voters attached to them and very kind of short term communications gains rather than longer term policy gains. I'm, I'm not sure that that I, I understand why Lee has said that, but I'm, I'm not sure it's it's fair on on the current administration. Actually, I think. Contrary to the myth, the current administration is less focused on campaigning and presentation than on actually getting right some deep-seated problems about um, governance and the way the country is, is run. But I think there has been a tendency over the past, well, probably going back to the early 1990s, for government to resemble an episode of um, what, what is that, um, what is that um, show with the shouting and swearing? Spin thick, of it. Um, thick of it. Thick of it. And, and the thick of it has been the template. And, and I know of examples where ministers would issue expensive, foolish, unevaluated policy decisions in order to get a press release to make them look good. They're, they're literally dancing for tomorrow's headlines at your expense, rather than going in with a clear set of their priorities. Even worse is we see a lot of people who become ministers going into their departments on the first day utterly clueless as to what it is that they want to do or want to change. And so that it's not so much that the machinery of the state captures them, they're an empty vessel, a blank slate for the machine to, to do with as they please. And they become mere sort of puppets, Merovingian monarchs sitting on a throne with the civil service and the Sir Humphreys and the vested interests deciding public policy behind them. So I... I think we do have a problem, but I I don't think it's fair to say this government isn't prepared to do something about it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm rather hoping that this government, rather like the government that came to office in 1979, some people might say it came to office a few months later, 1980, 81. Um, I hope that like that early Thatcher government, this government marks a genuine sea change precisely because they are not going to obsess about keeping the Beth Rigby's happy. In fact, the Beth Rigby's of this world hate this government precisely because this government doesn't really care what the smug punditocracy in Westminster thinks about things. They are focused on actually getting things done in the knowledge that they can communicate directly to the voters who matter about the things that are of concern to those voters, and they've got three, four years to do it. So I, I think actually this government is going to become very, very unpopular on Twitter, very, very, very unpopular on um, the Peston show, but frankly, I think it will continue to do rather well amongst what you might call the forgotten man, the forgotten women, the ordinary folk outside the London bubble, who actually find that for the first time since November 1990, they have a government that is on their side and thinks the way they do about the things that matter to them. And I think this actually could be a transformative moment. Australia's longest serving prime minister, a gentleman by the name of Robert Menzies, called them the forgotten people. He described them as those stuck between the elites at the top. The, I think it very much works today. Those who um, are the in big businesses who, who run the, the captains of industry and those at the other end, those who are well represented by unions, these days probably mostly public sector unions, um, who and the people between that, the forgotten people, um, who often don't have as, as loud a lobbying group in Westminster or Whitehall, but or Canberra or Washington DC, but still. They don't, do, they don't do a lot of tweeting. They are rarely interviewed by Peston and Rigby. 
but boy, yeah. do they have votes. And thank goodness they do. And as you just see, the premise of Michael Gove's speech was effectively trying to speak to those people. Um, Chris, I might be in on the question of to what extent, um, from your experience as a, as a policy evaluator, um, you can divide responsibility or you potentially should divide or should not divide responsibility between ministers and the civil servants who serve them. Um, do we, are we to some extent letting politicians off by really focusing here on, on civil servants? Um, are we being too hard on politicians? I mean, there seems to be a narrative, particularly in the Sunday Times has put forward that of a, a Boris who wasn't paying enough attention to this crisis, who um, really this all came as a result of him not going to COBRA meetings or whatever else that might be. Um, but even at a more broader level, to what extent do you think politicians are responsible for policy failings or, or are they just working in the infrastructure and the system, the institutions that are failing? Well, I mean, there is there are quite pe few pieces of research which talk about the average length of tenure of ministers, which I think is about 18 months. Um, so when you just get to grips with your um, brief, you're moved on to somewhere else. And of course, there is a there is a principal agent problem um, because civil servants are always going to be better informed about the areas that they work in because of, of what they do and how they do it. Um, I don't think we should let politicians off, though. I mean, don't we elect them to do make these decisions? Yeah, um, I you know, there are a number of times. So so having also been a civil servant, there are a number of times when ministers do look like they've gone native because so <clears throat> Jeremy Hunt, I have to say this, and I hope he's, he's obviously not listening, but Jeremy Hunt had the Department of Health nod. It's the slightly to the side nod that says, I'm trying to pretend I'm being em em empathetic, but I'm not. I really don't really give a damn. Um, and that, if you watch Department, I shouldn't really, um, if, you, if you look at Department of Health um, civil servants, they all have that nod. So um, I don't think we should let politicians uh, um, off. Um, I do think it's an inherent problem of government and it's why we should um, as much as possible localize so that we have many more agencies, many more relationships involved in government and we break up this, um, the natural tendency for government to be a monopoly that is socially wasteful. Yeah, I've, I've wondered what I said, Jeremy Hunt's ability to effectively scrutinise the health department is because of his extensive experience, and potential uh, frustrations in that department. Um, Douglas, wh where do you allocate the, the, the blame if you're going to play a blame game? Or, or how do you see kind of the role of ministers? What, at what point are they not taking enough responsibility? And at what point are they being failed by their departments? I, I think the party system has corrupted our political system. And um, it's because I felt this, I ended up leaving pretty much every party I ever tried to be a member of. Um, I mean, fundamentally, if you're going to choose people to sit in our national legislature in a safe seat, and you're going to, as a party, use that monopoly power you have to select a third-rate mediocrity and just tune in and watch a, a Bob Standard issue of Prime Minister's Question Time to look at some of the calibre of questions, that is the problem. It's not the fault of the British Constitution, it's the fault of the parties for putting into that institution people who couldn't run a bath. And I think until we have either political parties who are prepared to use competition to select the best candidates in their neighbourhoods, at the moment we have a Labour Party that selects people on the basis of, of uh, 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 intersectional political theory rather than competence and uh, effectiveness, even the Conservative Party, I'm depressed to say, has put into public life a number of people who I just don't think are up to the job. And I, I, I think unless political parties address this, we need to think about things like recall mechanisms and open primary candidate selection to, to, to deal with it. But, you know, I mean, there's, there's no point in trying to fix the British Constitution if you put into the cockpit of the Constitution, the House of Commons, people who are pretty third-rate mediocrities simply because you want a more representative in gender terms or ethnicity terms group of people I and mean, actually often that sort of political any institution that selects people on the basis of something other than competence becomes incompetent and the house of commons i think has a lot of people in it not all but a lot of people in it who are deeply incompetent and that 
That I think is the root cause of, of the political malaise. Fix that and then you will put in A grade people and those A grade people will simply not put up with a health minister who doesn't know what Richmond House is doing with billions of pounds of taxpayers' money. Um, so Conor Boyle has asked a question about uh, effectively the UK adopting a, a US style system of political nominations for state bodies with approval by commons. Do we need more political control of the bureaucracy, of the, the quangrocracy um, that, that now exists? I think uh, one of the rumoured concerns of the government when it comes to public health England is that while they can set a mandate for that body, they actually don't have operational control. Do we need more political um, appointments around? Maybe Douglas, you take this first and then Chris. I, I think you need uh, two forms of hyper, well, three forms of hyper enhanced accountability. First is meaningful accountability to Parliament. The people in charge of Public Health England or all those other quangos that preside over public policy making should live in fear of the House of Commons Select Committee. Um, the people in charge of that institution should uh, be subject to a confirmation hearing. They should annually have to appeal to the House of Commons Select Committee for confirmation of their 12-month budget, and it should be a 12-month budget, not a five-year deal done on the nod from the Treasury. And there should be a real risk that if the Director of Public Prosecutions or the Head of Public Health England doesn't get the approval of the House of Commons Select Committee every 12 months, they're out of a job. The next level of accountability should be outward accountability to the public. We need far more scrutiny over who these people are and the terms of conditions of their employment. And I think if people could see quite how cosy the appointment system is in the Quango state, uh, people would say simply, we, we, we can't have this. We, we are a democracy, we're not Romanov Russia. The third area of accountability, I think, is accountability to the center. Now, Blair came in with a massive majority and found that he needed to try to centralize control over departments of state because they wouldn't do what he wanted. So we, we, we mustn't repeat the error of, of the Blair era. But if you look at Australia, for example, they have the system of charter letters. And that means that every senior cabinet minister would be requested by number 10 Downing Street to sign up to a charter letter. And the charter letter would set out what the priorities were. So for example, the Home Secretary might be given a charter letter that would say this year, pretty, you are gonna focus on number one, I don't know, controlling our borders. Number two, uh, cutting crime. Number three, stopping the boats crossing the channel, whatever it is. And at the end of that 12 month period, you will be held to account by the center and by parliament and the public for how well you as a minister have done that. We need that system of charter letters so that the people who today notionally run their departments of state will either have to take control, to coin a phrase, or get out and make room for someone who can. If at the moment we've got a system where it's almost geared up in Parliament and the civil service to conceal ministerial muppetry, we need a system so that your own tribe gently exposes public policy failures so we can put them right. And until you do that, you're not going to get effective public policy administration in this country. I think a few of our, our listeners and watchers might have spotted your vote leave sign at the back there and, uh, and oh, the need to take, to take back control. I think we need to take back control uh, uh, both at a local level, but also uh, t- taking back control to individuals. Um, Chris, Brexit I might just... Is Brexit is the time to do this. It's a time for national renewal. We, 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 we need to rise to this occasion. There's no point being independent if you're going to be badly run that in a few years' time you're going to wish you were governed by Brussels. Look, it's, a mean, it's always been a means to an end. It's, this is an opportunity um, to be self-governing, I suppose. Uh, Eamon, Eamon Butler, our director, has asked a question about a more radical proposal. I might put this to you, Chris. Um, should we take the executive out of parliament so that MPs become scrutineers and not seekers after ministerial um, preferment? Should we follow the American founders and have a, a, a system of, of separated government? Um, or do you think uh, you're a fan of the Westminster system of accountability and scrutiny between ideally the ministers and... and the parliamentarians? I mean, I personally am a fan of the Westminster system. Um, for every presidential system, every federal system, um, presidential system, you can find a failure. I guess for every Westminster system, you can find a failure. Um, I happen to like our, our system. There are weird checks and balances that happen that I think generally work. Um, I am starting, um, and this is a little outside my um, specialist area, but I'm starting to be convinced by the idea of a written constitution um, and a more 
upfront conversation about how the different parts of the system work, um, partly because Scottish devolution just seems to have created all of the problems that um, uh, that Malcolm Rifkin predicted it would do 30, 40 years ago, um, that the kind of imbalance of power when we have a constituency in the north of Scotland um, that um, voters there are worth five times more than voters on the Isle of Wight um, and their MP is not actually doing most of what the um, MP for the Isle of Wight is doing. I think that's fundamentally unfair and, and creates tensions in the system. Um, there was one point I wanted to pick up about the, the Quango state because every government has tried Quango side and the last major attempt was in, in 2011 with major public sector reform. What's really interesting is that the government said it laid down criteria for why um, public bodies were going to be retained and why they weren't. And one of the criteria was those that give scientific advice. And yet, in reality, those bodies were five times more likely than other public bodies to actually be abolished. So the government said one thing and did exactly the opposite. Now, my assumption is that there wasn't some conspiracy at number 10 with Cameron saying, oh, let, let's, let's do it all this way. My assumption is that in departments, civil servants went, oh, well, what's the easiest way of meeting our Quango side target? Let's get rid of the, the um, committee for advice on which cheese we should buy for the canteen. Because um, if we get rid of that, we can still have the advisors give us advice. They just won't be doing so as a public body. And it looks like we've met our target. Um, Douglas, maybe back to you on the questions of governance reform. Do we yeah. need a, a written constitution? Is that the solution I, here? I'm not a fan of a written constitution. I think it would empower the judiciary and the, the um, guardianistas in wigs who sit in our courts. I don't think that's a good <laughs> idea. But Eamon asked whether or not the executive should sit outside the House of Commons. I mean, we're drifting towards that already because of this shortage of talent amongst those we elect. We're already ending up in a situation where the prime minister, in effect, whoever's the prime minister, in effect, appoints the people they want to come in as quite often members of the House of Lords or whatever. We're drifting towards this system. If we're going to do it, we need to do it properly. We need to rationalise the appointment system so there's proper accountability. We don't end up with a chumocracy and a sofa government. And also, I mean, Mark Sidwell has written a very, very good book published this week about the left's march through the institutions, the, the cultural Marxism. If we're going to have an executive that is appointed and accountable to parliament, but owes its position to the patronage ultimately of the prime minister, we need to rationalize the appointment system so that we can make sure that the kind of people who get appointed to these quangos are not the usual soft left guardian easters who presided over public policy making in this country for 30 years with disastrous effect. We need to make sure that actually we appoint the kind of people who represent the views and the outlooks of ordinary folk up and down the country. So I, I, I'm not against having an executive that is not in the Commons and is appointed, but I think we need to make sure that it doesn't just become uh, a way for the Cameroons and the Blairites to, 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 to carry on presiding over the rest of us. Uh, we've just got a couple minutes left, so maybe we'll just do some, some quick closing remarks on, just broadly speaking, what we think the potential for reform is. Are we optimistic or are we just going through the same rigmarole again and again and again and we've talked about this hundred times before and it's not really going to change because the Sir Humphreys of the world will keep everything going as it is. Chris may be first. Well I hope that Douglas is right and this is a once in a generation opportunity. Um, the coalescence of Brexit, an 80 seat majority and the realisation the, the powerful realization that the epidemic has brought that actually our system doesn't work, I'm hoping convinces enough people that we need to reform. Um, I, 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 but having watched too much, um, too many episodes of Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister, I suspect that the civil service will manage to undermine and uh, delay and prevent that reform from happening. Douglas, optimist or, or pessimist? I'm optimistic, and I'm optimistic for two main reasons. 
Dominic Cummings, Michael Gove. I, I work closely with Dominic on the, on, the, on the vote leave thing. I've observed Michael Gove close up for, uh, they're both very, very effective. And I think they're very, very signed up to, to, to change. Um, there's another reason I'm optimistic, um, partly through despair, there's no more money. So if you're in government and you want to give something to the voters, you're not gonna do it by mortgaging more debt. You're gonna have to do it by making sure the way you spend money is more productive and more efficient. Um, finally, I'm, I'm optimistic because all governments come to office and normally spend the first couple of years floating around enjoying checkers. It's only then that they start to recognize that they can't actually affect change. And it's only in the last few months of Blair and Brown that they realized they should have made reforms from day one. This government's different precisely because it's at that stage after its first six months in office. It now realizes without question that it needs change. It, it's got to change things if it doesn't want to drift towards failure at the next election. And I think that means there's a real window of opportunity. There are gonna be all sorts of vested interests. Theresa May on the back benches today was complaining. There are gonna be all sorts of Sir Bufton Tuftons in Whitehall telling us how dreadful and terrible this all is. <laughs> the louder the squeal, the better we can expect the change to be. Well, we at the ASI are always, always optimists. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Douglas and Chris for joining. Um, we're, we're just on an optimistic note, um, the government announced today some fantastic planning reforms the ASI has been talking about for years and years. Um, it is extraordinary to have a, a debate about uh, the role of civil servants and, and, and the, the capacity of government. I don't think we've had that debate, the extent to which um, we needed to in the past. And now it's very much in focus because of this crisis. Um, so hoping we can continue to make the case for, for those kind of necessary reforms. And um, apologies that unfortunately David Davis was on unable to join us this evening, but uh, we will have him back. Um, so we will have him soon for, for something, uh, or perhaps a webinar discussion uh, of its own. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Good night.